Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm James Gill from the National Centre for Writing, and as always, I'm here at our home, Dragon Hall, in Norwich. This episode is a Writing Life special to celebrate Noirich, the 2022 Norwich Crime Writing Festival here in our fine city. This year, the festival ran from the 8th to the 10th of September and featured events and crime and noir luminaries, including Janice Hallett, Emma Bamford, Vasim Khan and Charlie Higson. The festival also featured Ukrainian-born American and French artist and writer Yelena Moscovich, who, by the way, is currently staying at the cottage here at Dragon Hall. Yelena has written for Vogue, The Times Literary Supplement, Paris Review and many more. She has also just released her third novel, A Door Behind a Door, an exploration of the post-Soviet diaspora. We invited our friend, creative writing tutor and the godmother of domestic noir, Julia Crouch, to interview Yelena. And what a conversation it was. Strap in for a lively discussion about routes to becoming a writer, identity as a writer, ownership of your art, reading, what is crime writing, ideas of hell and much, much more. And you can look forward to another episode with Julia in which we explore how to grip your reader, which is a great conversation, useful to writers of any genre, and it's coming soon. For more information about our residencies, virtual or here at Dragon Hall, head to our website, nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. And just before we go to Julia and Yelena, I have enough time to tell you that our September term courses have begun. But worry not, our January term courses will be on sale soon. Do you want to kickstart your writing? Take it to the next level? Well, our courses are online, have tutors like Julia, and include one-to-one feedback on your work. And with beginners and intermediate courses in a range of different genres, we can get you writing and help you become the writer you want to be. Head to the website to find out more. And now, without further delay, I bring you Julia Crouch in conversation with Yelena Moscovich. Probably just what what I'm really nosy. So, uh, and we've got lots to talk about. So so I want to start off, first of all, by asking you what you're doing in Norwich. (laughs) You're so, staying in a cottage, yes? Yes, I'm staying in a cottage. I was invited to speak at the Noir Witch uh, yes. Festival, which is a crime festival. Um, and the invitation came to me with like a, a sort of self-realization because I didn't really know I was a crime writer <laughs> until I was oh, a cons- yes. <laughs> yeah, invited to speak uh, about crime writing, but... Um, so yeah, I was invited here and then the National Center for Writing, um, gave me a week and a half residency in conjunction with this lecture. And I'm also Um, giving a a workshop that's sort of in line with some questions and passions I have around writing. Yeah. Is that, is that the, uh, the, the, the body workshop? um, Yeah. 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 Have you done it yet or not? Is it coming up? No, no, it's, it's this Friday. Yeah. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm connected to Norwich in that I, I have just re- until recently I've been visiting fellow. I was kind of like a, like, oh, okay. a, like one of those cousins in the Victorian novel I was visiting for about four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but yeah, um, yeah so uh, so and I'm really sad to miss you because I normally would be there at Norwich, mm-hmm. uh, but because there was no there was no money for me to come. I didn't oh, okay. I didn't come okay. because I'm a bit skin at the moment. But um, yeah. But yeah, but it's, I, I really, um, I really wanted to hear your keynote, and actually, I did manage to get a hold of the transcript. So, oh, um, good, good, yeah, okay. So I can can refer to that today if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, so, 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 have you, have you, have you been into the Dragon Hall? Isn't this amazing? <laughs> yes, I've discovered. So, I was shown Dragon Hall the first day, and then I've kind of pitter pattered around the the city. So I've kind of, I've gotten glimpses and I've really been enjoying sort of how small and intimate that, I don't know if this is like, you know, a faux pas to talk about how small a a small city is because I know there's some pride involved in in the size, but um, yeah, because I come from Paris and it's a very big city and uh, it's a little... For me, it's a little fatiguing. <laughs> so actually, I've it's been, I love yeah. I love Norwich. I love I love the fact yeah. that it's so ancient and the ancient yeah. kind of, the, sort of it's a bit like Rome in that respect, isn't it? That the ancient kind of uh, nestles up against the the modern so yeah. kind of intimately. And the cathedral. Have you been there yet? Yes, and I love the courtyard uh, yeah. with the oh. with the labyrinth in the middle. It's yeah, yeah it's really just breathtaking. The the light that comes through and the peace it's like it's a really great container of of calm and quiet yeah great so it's a great I find it greatly inspirational have you been to the um, 
the oh god what's it called the St Ju- Julian's St Julian's Chapel I passed by it um it's I think worth going I, in and reading her story yeah 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 so I the first couple of days I was sort of I, I think I closed all the literal do- doors and all the figurative doors and I just kind of went into my writing because also the residency is an opportunity for me to sort of have some concentrated writing time. Yes, yes, and yes. so I think I was a bit of a latecomer to actually stepping out <laughs> into yeah. the into the real world, so to speak. So yeah. I'm ca- this week is my catch up week to yeah. you know go out for the sites. Cause, yeah, because she had the the kind of the dream gig really uh, back in the Middle Ages for 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 women um, to be an anchorite, which meant that you kind of had mm-hmm. a space that you were kind of sealed inside a cell where you could just get on with what you wanted and people bring you food uh, you didn't have to do anything yeah. except write and pray I mean obviously the praying bit would be a challenge for me but I really like the I yeah. kind of like the idea of being an right <laughs> yeah anyway, so Julian of Norwich was, uh, was, was one okay. of them um so yeah but I can understand that kind of pull between being somewhere that's kind of amazing and also yeah. being there to write because it's that yeah. division yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it between the real world and the imaginary world and, and yeah. you know as a writer you have to feed on the real world and bring it back to your death but, yeah uh, but also you need to put those hours in <laughs> yeah yeah well I think also sometimes we just need to go somewhere else to like lock ourselves away from a new location so I don't yeah. think it's as much like oh, no of course I I love you know discovering a new city or a new location but I think part of at least the residencies that I've experienced is going somewhere to also to be blind in a different landscape <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's exactly it isn't it so you feel guilty about not going somewhere else <laughs> going yeah. out somewhere else yeah I think I yeah I don't I don't feel guilty but maybe it's I don't know if it's my like Slavic or Jewish background I'm like no I, I feel okay with uh, it <laughs> I wish I had that. (laughs) My whole definition is based on guilt, I think. Yeah, yeah, I've been noticing that with the kind of like Christian Catholic. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yes. So, um, so am I right? You've written three novels to date. Um, The Natasha's Virtuoso and A Door Behind a Door. I've read A Door Behind a Door and I loved it. And I'm just, I I had to, I had to tear myself away from virtue I oh, say too so, they do this. So, okay. uh, so I really really love your writing uh, I think it's really um oh vibrant and muscular and transgress transgressive and um and 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 I love I love the rule breaking that goes on there, the formal rule, oh. rule, rule breaking, as well as the kind of, you know, the, the, the dealing with transgression and the whole kind of experience of the, the, the migrant experience and the and the outsiderness and the queerness. I, I love all of that. So um, so that's a great place to start, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, and I've got so many questions, but I think I'm going to start with um, the. The, the thing we the big I mean we're obviously we're f- sort of from different parts of the world entirely mm-hmm. metaphorically and literally but um the thing we do have in common is theatre mm. mm-hmm. and you 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 started off wanting to be an act like me you started off wanting to act and you went to Le Cop, which I'm so jealous about mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah tell me about well, that about that kind of impulse so I actually wanted to be an actor for like a very hot second it was like a year (laughs) when I was like 15 and then I quickly discovered that actually what I really wanted was to write characters Mm -hmm, more mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. act so I started writing yeah around that same age and then kind of fell in love with playwriting and and then directing and then that kind of opened up a lot of questions for me in terms of movement and the like collaborative creation like did playwriting have to be me writing it and then giving it off and then the actors learning the words you know what what kind of um kind of call and response could we have during the process Mm -hmm. so that sort of led me then to I did my um undergrad in dramatic writing and I guess like they let me I think put a title on it like experimental theater or something like this I just put experimental, I think, on whatever I do. But, um, and then, yeah, I went to Paris to specifically go to Jacques Lecoq because I had read uh, Jacques Lecoq's uh, Le Corps Poétique, which is, I think, The Moving Body, um, Mm -hmm. which was really, really inspiring and 
I felt like, oh, okay, there's actually like a kindred method to some of the things that I was trying to do that I couldn't quite figure out how to, I mean, of course, I'd seen things that were like a happening or somewhere between an installation and movement piece or something, but I hadn't really read someone with a specific method and process and approach to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's what really drew me to Lecoq. But I think it was really in the sense for me at that point, I had, I mean, really, I'd only wanted to be an actor for a year. And since then, even though I do performing every now and then, but it's more like, for me, it's just a way to be part of my writing. I yeah, yeah. Don't, don't really want to be an actor. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I got, I got disabused of that, 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 uh, that ambition when I was very young as well. Mm-hmm. When uh, I, I, I think real large because I realized I wasn't anywhere near as good as my peers on my drama mm. course I did drama at university in, in Bristol okay. in, in England um, but I do have quite a few friends that went through the Paris kind of Lecoq or uh, Gaulier uh, schools mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and 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 they all I mean they're all kind of like in their 50s 50s some of them in their 60s now and they all look back on it with kind of like um Oh, these were my golden years. This was this is where I really, really lived, and it was oh, hard, wow. hard, hard mm-hmm. work. Yeah, yeah. Because you learn. I think at Lecoq, there's no kind of um, writing stuff down, is there? There's all about making the work with your body. And um, yeah, yeah. I think now in the past years, some of the pedagogy is kind yeah. of put into question because it is a bit not just harsh, but I think the approach is maybe doesn't lend itself to um I don't know it kind of comes from this like patriarchal heritage of saying like here's the authority figure here are the guidelines and there's actually no leeway for anyone to have a different language with the guidelines so some of that is being put into question so I personally I mean I come from a Slavic background I think I'm just someone that really thrives on discipline so for me um it, I really enjoy. I think the discipline is something I lacked in America because I was just like, "Why are you? Come on! Like, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't need yeah. compliments. I don't." And then I went to Lecoq and I was like, oh, "Okay, I'll, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe Tell I don't me need as much." Wrong. Tell me when I'm doing it wrong. Tell yeah. me when I'm doing it wrong. That's Lecoq, yeah. Isn't it? yeah, yeah. And it was. I think what I really enjoyed about Lecoq was the precision that you know you had. Um, we had everything that we were doing was collaborative. So it was also learning to work with people that sometimes you couldn't stand. Um, and sometimes you would kind of be forcefully put with these people, I guess, yeah. to do some sort of character building <laughs> for yourself. But um, then we had, you know, when we had the sort of weekly performances, like these short performances of what we had created that week in front of the teachers, which was kind of a jury, we would start. And if any point we didn't, you know, if any point that the, the, our like level of acting became a bit slack, um, they just stopped us and said, thank you. Oh, and we couldn't terrifying. continue. So there was this precision that actually every moment mattered and you couldn't mm-hmm. just throw things away and get to the next one because you wouldn't get that chance. Mm-hmm. Wow. I got a bit um, waylaid by Grotowski in my early twenties, which is probably, you're probably love- quite familiar with. Love yeah. Grotowski. All yeah. that physical stuff mm-hmm. and that those kind of extended in, in, improvisations where you're encouraged to make manifest the metaphorical. It's yeah. just kind of met- or metaphysical. It was it was yeah. kind of it was just uh it was it was wonderful and empowering mm. and brilliant. But again, yes, the kind of the that that patriarchal authority, the kind of down through the people who had worked with the man himself. I was te- working with someone who had worked with him, and there was yeah. this line and and there was kind of and there was a slight rebellion in on certain of the camps mm-hmm. I went to. There were lots of women and kind of there was a little bit of an uprising occasionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's, well, I mean, maybe this is on another note, but I think it's very different, very difficult. Like we haven't quite conceived how to have like a, like a new world type of discipline because so much mm-hmm. of discipline is tied to sort of the I mean the existing power structure that we've inherited that obviously more and more we realize is not serving us but we don't really know because part of that power structure is this discipline that actually we need we don't need necessarily that discipline but we need discipline and we haven't quite imagined and also actualized what it would look like and I think that's it's really hard as a like a creator because you can't 
create without discipline. So there's, mm-hmm. I think, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a self regulation, a kind of anarchic self regulation that mm. is is required of us as creators, isn't there? Yeah. Kind of that we have to really manage ourselves, and in order yeah. to do that, we have to understand how management works in the in the outside world and examine it and re- reject or accept structures that yeah kind of imposed from outside I mean I think we're in a, in a state of terminal collapse at the moment in terms of society yeah. in terms of capitalism it's very mm-hmm. exciting to be alive right now if a little challenging at times yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah it's uh yeah as, as, as it's interesting I was talking with some friends last night all kind of again in their 50s and 60s and um talking about queerness and and mm. and, and relating to you know how the experience of that is challenging for older women and 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 kind of the whole trans debate and everything and then mm. and then how you know our daughters are say, or our children are saying mm-hmm. um I want to, I don't want these pronouns anymore and yeah. how that the yeah. idea of female pronouns something to be that we fought for as kind of a positive assertive thing is now being mm. it's, it's hard not to see it as a rejection but it is a, it's yeah. actually an evolution and we have to kind of understand that and yeah um, and and ride with it and kind of you know be alive to question it but also you know, it's change and change is happening at such a rapid pace. So to yeah. kind of pull this back to yeah. writing, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that you're talking about about um, about structure. And, and in a way, let's let's kind of stick with theatre a little bit and that mm-hmm. kind of collaborative enterprise in writing. Because obviously now as authors, we both kind of mm-hmm. are kind of queens of or queens or whatever monarchs, yeah. shall I say, to <laughs> genderize it of our of our destinies um, mm-hmm. and the destinies of our creative work. Although I I have I have probably am less kind of in command than you are in terms of you know form and commerciality and all of that we'll talk about that later but Mm -hmm. devising work working collaboratively in the theatre I that's what I did and Mm. you know I had a theatre company called Public Parts and we devised and and I I was direct devising director stroke writer I I, I called it kind of scribe really because I wrote up yeah rather than wrote Mm-hmm. And um, and we did about eleven shows over a period of about ten years, and until oh, wow. basically okay. until basically I had kids and I just couldn't do it anymore because yeah. <laughs> you know you need you need twenty four hours a day to do that. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. And I love the democratic nature of it. I love the fact that all the scripts we produce then are owned by everyone. The, from the from the actors to the director to the stage manager to the woman who worked in the office who put the kind of the the kind of whole economic structure mm. in place for us to do that work yeah. so you know everything was owned jointly and and the, mm. you know, every input was valid whatever it was um mm. what was your experience of, of working collaboratively and devising I think actually I yeah I would say that that aspect was a bit frustrating for me because I think I'm I'm kind of a lone wolf at heart. And at the same time, I think like this life has taught me a lot about being collaborative (laughs) in in my personal and creative life. So I think that's just where I've needed to learn to be a bit more flexible. But at the same time, I think I've also learned to respect my own working process, which is that I, the words are, in a sense, my own, they're my responsibility and my euphoria and my, and so I think that, I mean, there's different ways of working. And so I was working with people that each brought something that they were in a sense, maybe responsible for, or they were in a sense, it was, it was sort of there. So it wasn't that everything belonged to everyone. And it definitely wasn't um, democratic because there are people that had a say about certain things and there was still a hierarchy. I was still the director, so I w- I was the one that sort of had a say about the cohesive vision and direction. Um, but it just wasn't, you know, a totalitarian approach. So of course, I was open to, you know, hearing um, this or that or, or collaborating sort of in between the lines. But I think it w- the division was still quite clear, and I think that's something that I need. And part of the reason why I left theater, other than you. I mean, this is a whole nother topic, but either you need to be patroned by someone with a lot of money and resources, or you need to already have that, or you need to have some sort of martyr-like energy to give up your whole life to do theater, um, which I didn't have. And also, I just missed kind of being wholly in charge of, of 
my words and what I do and and also not being so dependent on the resources and the time of others, which mm-hmm. can be beautiful, but is also just really difficult when you when you it's still struggle thing. so much that yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I really just missed writing and it was so nice to just have me and my words on the page and my word yeah. document and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I always say that it's um for me writing novels is 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 a bit like the dividing process with actors, except there's no fucking actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so you know, so so it's I mean I I I think I learned a lot from from working in that way about, you know, kind mm-hmm. of about dialogue, about about status transactions, about because that because when I'm talking with writers who haven't come through theatre and you talk about status, it, it mm-hmm. kind of people go, what? Wow. Yeah. And, and of course, those of us that have kind of worked in that field, we know about, you know, kind of, you know, those games, those theatre games where you've number yeah. one to six and all of that. And yeah. um, and, and it, it can be such a really. Um, uh, oh, and, and the other the other thing is actioning, you know, the um, they do it a lot in when they're using text based plays. Now they sit down and for the first week, every mm-hmm. they just, they just work, work through the the text uh, assigning a verb to each um what am I ah, doing with this speech oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh-huh. that kind of unlayers it's a kind of yeah. it's a uh Matt Stafford Clark kind of coined mm-hmm. it uh, in mm-hmm. his in his book Letters to George um uh and it's a way of kind of unraveling the subtext or the intention behind action because very often as we know as writers and mm-hmm. as people that we don't often say what we mean and we don't often mm-hmm. do with a, what our words imply that we're doing with them yeah. so that's that's a that can mm-hmm. be a really interesting way to look at writing um yeah so 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 this um kind of uh wanting to kind of I wouldn't say retreat but advance into your mm-hmm. study on your own did that yeah. come gradually or was it kind of like right I'm done with that I'm now doing this or was there a segue I think it uh, it felt very sudden, but I'm sure that it was more gradual than it felt. But I think it was also, there were a lot of things that were being kind of wrapped in one where I was in France with a student visa and I was f- finishing my, st- I had gotten already a master's. And basically if I wanted to stay in France, I could go and try to get a PhD just to re-get the visa. But I just am not, uh, I'm not very interested in studying and I think I already the fact that I made it till the master's was more for my visa um even though I'm very fascinated by examining but not in I think and not in an academic structure which I think is very funny because I teach but uh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and you right. I mean I've read I've read your writing some of your writing and it strikes me as kind of like I was a bit like a, oh wow <laughs> it's a, it's so much kind of quoting of Barnes here and, yeah. and kind of philosophy and stuff yeah and, and I felt a bit kind of like oh gosh <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're yeah, yeah. a very academic person but obviously, obviously yeah. you're, you're a lot a lot more than that um yeah. and and you also said which I found really interesting you read very slowly and that informs yeah. your, the form of your writing. I'm a yeah. really slow reader too, and oh, it's a real yeah. drawback as a writer yeah. that, that well, you're supposed drama, to read all these books. And I think I think this is the thing, like that writers we have such a uh, such a, a vision and almost like an idolatry of the of the identity of the writer, and so anyone that kind of starts out writing, or once we start to like develop ourselves as as a writer, we have also a responsibility to recreate you know to have the writer be what what we are and so who says that a writer needs to read a lot and who says that a you know like or what I mean what and what what does it mean to read a lot I, I think this whole thing about quantity like what is it we don't know like some people have I mean, a lot of people have a very different relationship to language. So for them to read a sentence and the space that a sentence will have inside them and the way that they'll carry that sentence can be much much bigger and more vast than someone who has read three novels in that time. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's very hard to start comparing these things. And I know that I'm, I'm a slow reader and I, I'm slightly dyslexic. I think part of it had to do with the fact of sort of learning three alphabets at a young age and yeah, possibly sure with that. my immigration. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I, yeah, I, this is, this is who I am. And I write, that's why I think I, I really, every word is, uh, is felt and given as intensely as I feel it. And I'm someone that 
is highly sensitive. So I, I would be that person for whom a phrase, a word, a line would um, have so much impact. And sometimes it's it's like, you know, when you see an art piece, you can't maybe see the whole collection. Maybe just that art piece is so mm. overwhelming in the best of ways that you just need time to live live that experience for a while. Thank you. You have given me the non-guilty explanation. <laughs> yes, my, please don't my feel guilty. Inability to, to, to motor through books. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. I always kind of I have my to be read pile um, of mm-hmm. books that are sent to me by friends who are writers or sent to me mm-hmm. by publicists as proof copies, and and mm-hmm. I just it takes me so long. And you know, anyway. yeah. But I but I yeah. as I say, I I ate yours up because oh, you. partly because yeah. they're read by they're written by a slow reader. <laughs> Yeah, I read it because they are. Yeah. I, I thought when I was uh, the, the door behind the door, behind a door behind a door <laughs> that um, I thought this is a series of this is kind of this reminds me of a, a play script the way it's the way it's mm. Um, mm-hmm. set out, but it's also kind of feels like a series of poems. So, mm. uh, but, but they're, they're very intimately narratively linked. So, yeah. um, so uh, my novels a kind of much more traditional and much more um, uh, commercially kind of mm-hmm. generated than yours. But obviously I didn't start off like that. And, mm-hmm. and when I wrote my first novel, Cuckoo, which was published in 2011, um, mm-hmm. my agent said to me, do you know what you've written? And, and I said, well, I thought it was kind of, because I was exploring mm-hmm. consciousness as narrative. So I thought it mm-hmm. was kind of um, possibly something a bit Virginia woolf because I'm mm-hmm. a great fan of Virginia Woolf. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, you've written a crime novel. And I was oh. horrified because <laughs> I was such a snob about crime fiction. Oh, yeah. um, and since then, obviously, I've read loads and loads and loads of crime fiction. Slowly, read loads yeah. and loads of crime fiction, and um, and I've I've come to appreciate the kind of the the, the discipline uh, mm-hmm. as we were talking about earlier, and the um, the, uh, the the the. the the politics of crime fiction, that the the, mm-hmm. the 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 way it kind of can hold a mirror up to a society and kind of unpick it and examine it, the best of crime fiction that is, and that, that it kind mm. of rather than being exploitative, it's it's the reverse of exploitative. That it's actually it's actually tends to be fairly kind of socialist in its kind of impulses, um, and um, and can kind of just get under the skin of mm. of, of of a world in a way that possibly other genre fictions and literary fiction can't always manage in such a kind of I suppose accessible way as well um, I'm thinking because because of the story carrying it now you're probably rejecting about 20 things I've just said there (laughs) no (laughs) but um but um in a sense I mean that's that's what your work does Mm -hmm. when did you come to the realization that you were a crime writer, and how did you feel about that? Uh, well, yeah, well, like, as you said, when you were invited to talk at Noir, right? yeah. So when I was invited, yeah, to talk at the festival, that's when I, yeah, that's when I had to really face. I mean, face sounds the like accusation. Like thing. <laughs> yeah, and, but I didn't. The thing is, I didn't have that association with crime writing because for uh-huh. me, everything in genre, and I'm so. I think uh, disillusioned and dare I say disappointed by everything that is called literary fiction. So I'm like, why? I think it's so elitist to, yeah, Yeah. I don't know. So for me, I didn't really have that outlook. It was more like, oh, oh, did I, you know, did I overlook something in my own, in, in my own creation? Like, did I, how, how are, you know, did I not see something that is so evident or something? Um, And so, and actually I was asked to, I was pitched to write this piece for um, this piece about crime fiction. Yeah. And and so that's where I sort of, I wrote that every Russian uh, novel is a, is a crime novel. Um, And that was sort of my first curiosity about, okay, well, you know, it's true. It seems very evident. I mean, of course I, on a very basic level, I have, murders and crimes in all three of my novels. Um, and I also have like a lot of kind of surreal or metaphysical crimes of like someone that killed someone in this time frame or this time zone and is suddenly somewhere else, you know? Yeah. So for me, it was actually a really stimulating proposition of a way to look at language and form. And I thought, hold on. Okay. 
because really for me, it doesn't matter what genre anything is. I just want something to be happening that's sort of alive and exciting with language and form. And so I thought, okay, well, what does actually, what is the essence of crime? Um, what would it feel like or what, how can we conceive it if it was, you know, a language being spoken instead of a story being told? And that was sort of the lecture um, that I gave because it was the sort of burning question that I was left with after realizing that I was a crime writer was, you know, what if crime wasn't about a story, but it, it was about a language? Yeah, about about the 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 the, um, the 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 transgression of language, the transgression of yes, yeah, exactly. I uh, I talk about you know the criminality of a work and how a language. There's Evgeny Zamyatin, who's a, a Russian novelist who wrote he wrote We, which is like the science fiction, but uh, he also wrote The Flood, which is actually a very lesser known crime surreal kind of crime fiction. But he he said, I don't remember from where this is from, but he said, the world is kept alive by heretics. And I think literature is kept alive by heretics, by sort of like heretics of language. And so I there is, it's not necessarily, I mean, we can call it a transgression, but I don't think it needs to be in relationship to there's a norm and then we transgress the norm. What if we're actually purifying? What if we're actually look going to the origins and liberating the origins because it doesn't have to be transgressive in the fact that we're assuming that what we have is the foundation and we're going to transgress the foundation yeah yeah so 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 your wonderful final exhortation to your to your at uh, the attendees at the norwich uh, mm -hmm. uh, keynote speech was um uh, is go to hell and be as terrible 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 <laughs> as you haven't even yet imagined which i just yes. love what a liberating yeah. thought. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You talk a lot about hell as a place of kind of transgression and truth. Was it? Was that what you said? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Something like that, wasn't it? Transgression mm -hmm. and truth. And it make, you make hell sound an incredibly attractive place <laughs> to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned that, you know, hell, I think, in the West is sort of unfortunately... Uh, described as this, you know, derelict atmosphere of of moral suffering, and it's this, you know, where everyone will be judged and criticized and and um, oh, and as, Gret, as Del Gret says in Top Girls, she says oh, it's a place where the birds have bums with faces that eat you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, I mean, a place where you get judged and criticized and punished sounds a lot like our reality. So. Why yeah, would yeah, yeah. that why yeah. would that be hell? And so for me, and again, I don't know if it's kind of coming from the Slavic heritage, but hell is actually this almost beloved place because it's a place where you get to sort of confront and integrate a lot of the the darker or difficult or complex or yes, inherently painful things. And you get to sort of face that, contemplate it, maybe grapple with it in a way where nothing has to be right or wrong. Actually, morality is finally taken out of the picture and how, whereas in the real world, uh, I don't know, if, it's not that we can't live without it, but we haven't yet imagined or created a world that, or maybe we can't, I don't know, that's a question for well, maybe we, a we philosopher. Have, yeah, we've yeah. messed that one up pretty much so far, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, it's kind of like hell sounds like the place where crime fiction happens, really, where we kind of, mm. where we, um, where we look at, you know, what happens if the rules are broken, if the rules, if, if you know, if the rules aren't, don't exist, if somebody plays without rules, mm. then, then what happens? And then you hold that up to, to what the real world, the real world mm. has, and you kind of, kind of clash them together. And that's where the story, the heart of the story is, isn't it? In that kind of interface between yeah. hell and... Well, I think there's, I mean, if I uh, if I look at sort of what I know of the more traditional crime structure, it's that there's some sort of um, order being broken in terms of either human decency or a moral code. And then it's going to be reinstated by some sort of kind of Dante-like seeker, which would be the detective. Um, and at the same time, and so most of us think, and even readers think, oh, okay, so that's sort of the, the journey of a crime novel. But actually the real journey of a crime novel is whatever 
quote unquote evil or rupture in, you know, in the natural laws that happens, it's the darkness that that's going to bring out in the detective. And that's actually the pulse of the story. And every single crime story has that you can't have a sort of protagonist that's going to face um, a crime without the, the sort of the, the push or the velocity, the emotional velocity of the story being about that person's own darkness. Yes. So, so through 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 whatever happens, they're forced to face themselves, face their inner conflicts, and 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 then and then somehow learn or change, grow in one way or another through the through the process of the the. Yeah. Well, what I like about crime fiction is even though um, sort of on the surface it seems like a lot of you know either the criminal is found or there's something that's resolved or wrapped up. But usually in terms of the protagonist and their emotional journey, we're usually left with with that person on the brink. Okay, now they've seen, it's like it took them the whole story to see the darkness. Now what are they going to do with it? And I think that's really, that's really wonderful about that form that actually maybe there's some plot or logistical points that are resolved, but that it takes us to a place to the brink of, of the question. And that's why that's why a crime series is so uh, attractive for a writer mm. and for a reader is that that mm-hmm. kind of there's this protagonist that's dragging this ever, or rolling this ever increasing snowball of kind of yeah. like like terror yeah. terrible things terrible mm-hmm. kind of things learned through terrible doings through yeah. the whole series so yeah it can be really yeah. exciting to to kind of encounter that um so mm-hmm. so talking about endings you talk about how how resolution isn't your thing and mm-hmm. and I'm kind of the same and in fact you know what I have to kind of put my hands up here because what I try to do with my novels mm-hmm. I do try and nudge the form a little bit so, you know, <laughs> like my my last novel the new mother the last but one novel the new mother was kind of partly every other chapter was an Instagram post for example mm-hmm. and um and I've used diary form and I've mm-hmm. I've tried writing from the point of view of a house and Ooh, um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working with the point of view of a dog at the moment without making it cutesy or cosy but mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. um so, so so I do try and kind of play with form a little bit um and and quite often one gets um kind of pulled up by the Amazon reviewers who kind of mm-hmm. go uh, I didn't understand this or uh, this wasn't yeah. this isn't a proper crime fiction call this a call this a thriller oh, yeah. question mark question mark yeah. anyway yeah uh so so my was my the her husband's lover my, my the book three books ago um mm-hmm. ends in a very open way mm-hmm. and it was a really kind of and it was a really big punt that because I had two endings I had one where everything was sewn up and one where it was kind of like there is still massive questions and I really like the fact to leave the reader walking mm. away with a kind of the door to because because reading is an mm. immersive experience and and you're in the world of the novel and then as you leave at the end there's a door open a chink in mm-hmm. the in in the wall between the novel and the world and you carry that with you and you're wondering about the characters yeah. and you're you're not everything's tied up because also that's not life nothing is ever tied up neatly yeah you know, we, yeah everything I mean, has its reverberations absolutely I think whenever I teach uh fiction I always say that you know the the pencil has to go off the page at the end of the novel the, the story has to go off it has to fall off the edge of the page yeah um, nice. and I think Otherwise, if it doesn't, then what we have is maybe um, an essay or a tristis or or some sort of even academic work, but it, it's not fiction. And so it's also thinking about what is fiction, what what can it be, what's its force? And not that doesn't need to be limiting. It doesn't mean, you know, okay, now we have to say what is fiction and what isn't fiction, but to really use the elements that fiction has that other forms don't have and use them you know with the most uh intent and with the kind of most craft and mastery because that's when they are going to be the most powerful and the most uh resonant to the reader and beyond um and my last novel ends with a comma (laughs) and so it, it doesn't really end um and uh yeah I won't give you the last line but it also uh, no, I don't want to give that away the thing with crime fiction you can't yeah. do spoilers 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no spoiler. There's absolute. there's nothing that you can, I think, spoil <laughs> in my novels because there's, uh, there's nothing that gives you the, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. There's, yeah. But, um, but I think in terms of the expectation of maybe the industry or the readership, which is actually, unfortunately, so governed by the, the sales aspect of the industry. So I do yeah. wonder yeah. if readers were more liberated as humans, uh, what would their what would their capacity and desire for literature, what would that be? But um, but I think that it helps to have disappointed readers early on in one's career. Then you're then um, I think then the fanship that you have and the kinship that you have with readers are readers that are looking to be disappointed in that way. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. my kind of most loyal readers even though they're, you know, a small little army, but, you know, they got my back and they come in yeah. and that for every, yeah. you know, yeah. zero star review, they, they'll they just a paragraph about how and why. And, um, right. and so you also see that there's, uh, that there's, you know, the people that need these things that feel disappointed that, that your work doesn't provide these things. The thing is they can find that at every corner. So yeah. yes, they were disappointed because maybe they had an expectation, so they were led this way or that way. But maybe they didn't think about the fact that they had this experience that they would never have had. They had an opportunity to be angry in a whole new way. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, so where do you think when you're writing? Where does the reader sit in your head? Are they kind of like here, or are they over there, or are yeah. they not even kind of? Are they behind the curtain? I don't even th- I think nobody exists when I'm writing I think it's nice. yeah I, I don't Very think of the the reader at all I think I I don't even know where I am I would say it's the it's the closest thing for me that I know to kind of this trance state without making it a grandiose it's not yeah, you know yeah. it's yeah. it's a very banal trance it's not you know yeah. but um but yeah I think it's really a place of utmost freedom and I think if I was maybe a virtuoso dancer or something like that, then I would, I think it would feel equivalent like that to be in my body when I'm like in the air, or like when I, you know, so it's, it's a place of dancing where I don't think when you're in it, I don't think you're conscious of where the lights are, where the audience is, where maybe it's something you think about in those um, intervals when you're mm-hmm. prepping or before, after, but during, I don't have that consciousness. Great. How liberating. <laughs> I'm so jealous of that, too. <laughs> um, and uh, and so so in terms of uh, sort of your writing process, if we can get down to kind mm-hmm. of the more kind of yeah. mundane, nitty-gritty <laughs> process things. Of course. Where, I mean, all three, I, I, I have to say, you know, I haven't even, well, I've, I've got it on a waiting list, uh, your mm-hmm. first novel, The Vanessa, mm-hmm. The Natas, the, why The Vanessas? The Natasha's. <laughs> um, and the, the two I have read are very, very different in form. The formal mm-hmm. approach is kind of, I mean, you're, you're writing in short paragraph verse or, or short mm-hmm. lines and sections yeah. and segments, but it's very, very different. I'd say that kind of in terms of you know the traditional form, virtuoso is, is much closer to mm-hmm. that than the door behind the door, which kind of yeah. explodes form a little further. And mm-hmm. I understand that Natasha's was kind of unconsciously and very, very um, immediately experimental in form, very kind of fragmented is that right am I right there from my understanding yeah I mean I wrote the Natasha so I didn't you know I worked a full-time day job my whole life and was that type of I mean I always I never really doubted if I was a writer if I was not a writer but for me a writer was just someone that either had money and could write or if it didn't have money had a day job job and then wrote yeah um and I was the latter and so I wrote the Natasha's sort of you know around in the evenings in the mornings whatever on the weekends uh, around this job and I didn't really have any friends that were writers or friends that were kind of bookish in any way um I actually didn't read a lot of novels I mainly read poetry and plays um and the novels that I read I think were very sparse and experimental partly due to my <laughs> difficulty of reading and so I wrote this novel and not thinking about it as, you know, so starkly experimental. And then 
when I started showing, when I started, you know, also researching, like, what do I do with it now? How do I get it published? And then realizing I have to send it, you know, to agents and others. And then when I started getting feedback, that was often like, oh, I've never read anything like this before. Oh, wow, you break all the rules. Um, And so for me, that was sort of the blessing of uh, being naive and not naive in the fact that like, oh, I should have read more novels. I don't think anyone should. You just, you know, I don't think it would change my writing if I read novels or if I don't read novels. People have this way of looking at, you know, the biography of of writers as if like, oh, that's why you write what you write. It's like, no, that's why it had some sort of influence, but I am who I am. And I didn't, I don't need to read, you know, I, I could be in prison and only have access to two books and I would still write what I write. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. with some different, you know, with a slightly different spectrum of whatever. More prison. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm not in prison, and I write a lot about prison. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So, um, so how does that stand with the kind of the university creative writing course model? Because, because presumably your day job now uh, kind of is is about yeah. teaching, as as mine well, is. Um, now it's it's a little I, I let then um I I mean it was my day job was also tied to my visa and then once I got a nationality yeah. in in France I could start being freelance so now I'm actually freelance I don't have a necessary like a oh, set yeah. day job yeah. um but I was working as a fiction lecturer and the creative writing director of the Paris program of the University of Kent mm-hmm. and so I at first many years ago when I was just sort of doing a class here and there for them or workshops um I felt like oh do you I know I didn't I didn't teach I didn't um learn creative writing I didn't you know study fiction in any way I also am someone that's like such a you know a terrible like renegade when it comes to the academic structure so it's like you want to put me in an authority position where my perspective in being a student is to go against authority so I'm not sure is this karma like what is this yeah yeah um and I don't know how I'm going to approach this subject because I also am not sure I don't think that writing can't be taught it's not that it's how do I teach uh people not to write how to somehow and also that part of writing is um unraveling your own moral code and the way that you view yourself and your worthiness as a person because that translates directly to the um, the freedom and the access that you're giving yourself to language and subject so a little by little actually I realized that how that there was a way that I could teach fiction that was actually that filled me that inspired me so much and filled me with so much passion because it was this sort of hybrid of maybe a little bit of a psychological or theoretical approach in terms of questioning um, yourself and the connotations of worthiness that you have with, uh, with language and also your approach to expressing yourself, your relationship to your own voice. And then on the other hand, to really look at um to break down language into uh, dynamic elements and Mm -hmm. to be able to compose in a sort of non-intellectual way. And so my approach to teaching fiction encompassed those two things. And I realized that even though right now, maybe they sound a bit abstract, but it was such an accessible and interactive and dynamic way of teaching. And I got such an amazing response from students. And I realized actually this is the same way that we view experimental fiction or this approach as it's very heady and tedious. And actually it's not, it seems a lot more intuitive and people grasp it and seem to write uh, with a lot less complex about writing. That's really interesting. So it's about a process of liberation rather than kind of, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, shackling to a certain sort of form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, so in terms of, in terms of your, uh, of, 
we've got to stop soon which is ridiculous because mm-hmm. we've only just I feel like we've only just started yeah. here. so so what did I really want to know from you oh yeah I wanted to know and this is kind of this again is kind of like I'm I'm a, as you probably have guessed I'm quite practical I'm quite a kind of um mm-hmm. a craft person when it comes I'm very interested yeah. in the craft of writing mm-hmm. um and that's that's kind of more how my my teaching goes so it's completely different to yours um, mm-hmm. but uh but uh, you know I think I think there's there's room for all, everything in this world um and I'm just I'm saying that in defense of my own approach, not to attack to you. Um, <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but what I want to know is so when does the form arrive to you? Does it the, the do you just start writing and the form presents itself? Or do you go, okay, I want to say this, how do I say it? Where or is it is it or can you not answer that because they're inextricable because of this amazing kind of like um moment you put yourself in when you're writing I think I it take before I kind of begin a work I spend a good moment trying to um trying to access how I can feel the work in its entirety but without knowing what would happen um and so that 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 takes a lot of non-writing it takes like a lot of like walking around and kind of imagining and danger like yeah this kind of uh, like uh, melting into a fluid and and going into every direction and then at a certain point I have this very keen cohesive sense of what it would feel like to read this novel or this work in its entirety huh, so you know that reader, feeling yeah, yeah yeah I guess the reader or me you know as the writer like yeah. what would it feel yeah. like what am I left with and I think because I know what I'm left with then I can work towards that and everything else is discovery so for me it's a mood and a feeling that I would be left with when this work is experienced and as soon as I have that then I go and then the form I feel like is kind of already there and just blossoms as I work I don't feel like Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. necessarily need to impose and when I do the work uh, makes it clear that I can't anyway so (laughs) So, so in terms of drafting, do you kind of like write a kind of quick and dirty and then kind of go back and edit? Or do you kind of work in pieces or do you work in fragments and collage or what? Yeah, I actually, I do the thing that um, most, uh, like especially young writers are, are told not to do. I highly over edit as I go. So I'm like writing a sentence, editing the sentence, writing a sentence, editing the sentence. Then I write a paragraph. Then I go back to that first sentence. I re-edit the sentence. Oh, so wow. actually when I'm done with my first draft, it is very fine-tuned. Um, and I don't need many subsequent drafts. Um, mm-hmm. And if I do, they're kind of small changes, but I spend a lot of over, maybe overly meticulous time because language is... It needs to be pitch perfect for me to finish yeah. the draft. So, yeah. yeah, I would say the first draft is kind of maybe what one does in like 10 drafts. But I also spend a good amount of, you know, time with that first draft. And um, do you have a relationship with an editor that kind of you work with? Or is, is it very much you working on your own? I... It's actually been very different because I've had different publishers for oh. different novels. So for my first one, I when I was with Serpent's Tale and I was with Hannah Westland and I was very new you oh, know, to no. the industry and everything. And I was also this, I think I'm still the stubborn writer where I wasn't, I didn't know that, you know, an editor was going to be a part of the novel. Like I just thought you just publish novels. So it took me a while to, to think, you know, to understand like, oh, you want to have an opinion about this? Yeah. But I, there's no point. I, I'm giving you a finished work, you know. So yeah. I think um, so that kind of learning um, how I'm going to work together with the editor and being very upfront with the fact that, you know, some people really seek an editor to almost like not write the book with them, but to really like have their hands dirty within the work. And for me, I cannot have that when I give the editor the draft. It's basically done and of course they can edit it but you know but it's not there's no fundamental structural things like that there's no changes no no, no, go back and make this first person present tense kind of thing maybe maybe a section maybe a section you know okay but not you know of course I'm open to these ideas but it's like 
you, it's already been created. Yeah, so in a yeah. sense, it's yes, it's just a yes or no. And I fully respect if an editor is like, you know what? No, I would. And I've had editors, you know, when I'm shopping around a manuscript say, I love this, but I would do it like this. And then I think, yeah. well, then do it like that and give me back my manuscript. <laughs> you know? Great, great, great. Well, Ah, oh, there's so many other things I want to ask you, but uh, we're, we're completely running out of time now. And if I start, what I really wanted to ask you is how much is your work influenced by your identity as a refugee, neurodivergent, queer, Jewish, mm, Ukrainian born yeah. woman? Um, and perhaps you could give me a one minute answer to that. I think that, like I said before, I don't think that uh, my identity has necessarily created my approach to writing or my approach to language. But I think um, having been in between the lines of um, being seen in terms of, um, you know, in Ukraine, in Soviet Ukraine, not being considered, you know, a native and being considered sort of a foreigner just by the fact that I was Jewish and then being a foreigner for the rest of my life everywhere else, being a foreigner, foreigner to sort of the, the gender norms and to the heterosexual norms and also being a foreigner in terms of you know, financial access. But all these things, I think, allowed me to stay a stranger to the norm and also a stranger to what is explicit. And I think that's, in general, my approach to writing is that I thrive in the implicit and I thrive in either what you can't do, what you shouldn't do, or what nobody wants you to do. <laughs> perfect perfect for crime fiction perfect <laughs> well thank you so much you know, that was just really really interesting and again you know i just love we could now just go down to the pub and oh, have a yes pint of alcohol free lager and carry on yeah. talking but, uh, but you <laughs> must get you back so to writing much. and i must get back to writing so uh, yes so enjoy thank you your so, time so in much. beautiful night thank you and really great thank, to meet you yeah thank you so, if so you're much if you ever down in brighton work. call me up yeah Yes, I will. Yes. 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 And if you're ever in Paris. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Well, yes. of course. <laughs> okay. Right. Take care. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. A massive thank you to Julia and Yelena for that great conversation. If you have questions or want to get in touch, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Writer Centre, and you'll find us on Facebook by searching National Centre for Writing. Don't forget to sign up to our weekly newsletter by visiting nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk and clicking the orange drop-down box on the homepage. As a UK-registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website today by hitting the Support Us button in the top nav. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review us because it helps other writers to find the podcast. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode.